Yes, Jesse. Yes, sir. How are you today? I'm doing well. And yourself? Uh, outstanding. Uh, had a remarkable day in court yesterday in front of Judge Hoka, and Mr. Sorce was pretty much stumped. Um, I can give you a briefing. Uh, uh, we, would you, where would you like me to begin? <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, I, I do appreciate your call, and yeah, I guess there was a little bit of a snafu. We don't necessarily need to go into that, but yes, I, you did. You did have a hearing. Yeah, so just, uh, and I am, I am recording this call myself. And, Absolutely, that's wonderful. Right, right. Of course, and, and of course, anytime there's a com, any, anytime somebody's calling in or out of a facility, of course, the facility it's being recorded as well. But nevertheless, Absolutely. yeah, of course. Um, of course, you had a hearing yesterday. These are essentially it was a, a several, I guess, post conviction. Uh, on, of course, you've been you were convicted of the murder of Otis Clay, uh, seven years, almost seven years to the day, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in Cabell Circuit Court, and it's something that you've that you have long even then maintained your innocence. But yeah, what 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 was the hearing concerning yesterday? Alan Mock 
chief medical examiner where I did actually get that unsealed. Uh, I gave Judge Hoke a copy of that autopsy report in my motions, and he did read it. I can read it on the record. And uh, it was just absolutely astonishing. Uh, and, and the reaction from the court was absolutely astonishing. It was a great day. I got a lot accomplished. Okay, and... Yeah, I, I'll probably ask some quick questions. I know sometimes we spoke previously. We may have had to make two, you know, two or three calls because I think they time out of your, about what fifteen twenty minutes. But what uh, if you're at liberty? Or if, you know, if it's not an issue, what was the reason for the change of the hearing from four o'clock in Huntington to eleven okay, o'clock? That's a very good question. Um, okay. I, I can't answer. Judge Oak apologized for that. He said that uh, it, it, it just be, it, it became an issue where there was a lot of people making calls and wanting to participate, and he just decided that this was going to be uh, in the uh, Lincoln County Court rather than the Cabell County. I can't answer that. I really have no answer for that. I believe he didn't want to. Um, they, they, I believe they really didn't want the media presence because of Mr. Sursay. I really believe that. Okay. But never Mr. Sursay was disqualified from the Hades entirely. He's but his arguments were absolutely just, they, they were as sickening as the false testimony that was provided in my trial and to the grand jury. It, it was horrible. He, he actually tried to support the false testimony with other false testimony, and it, it just didn't fly. Okay, so he is disqualified because you have a pending habeas. Now, is he still the prosecutor that's reviewing your grand jury application? Uh, there's a problem with that. He opened up a door with that also when he said about his uh, being, a, being a professional friend of Christopher Childs and Christopher Childs nominating him as the vice president of the National District Attorneys Association when Chris Childs himself was the president of the same association. Uh, and I did bring that up because he opened up the door. I never made that uh, allegation in my motion for his disqualification. However, he was very quick to provide such. And so we run right through that door. Why would we not? Um, evidently, there's a very close professional relationship, and there is a question of his impartiality and his objectivity in representing this matter against Christopher D. Childs, who has put him in a higher status within the legal community by, you know, uh, nominating him and representing him and giving him all these wonderful credits. And they've had bidders, and they've actually had uh, a cookout in his house with another prosecuting attorney who are all close friends. So once he opened up that door, I certainly walked through it. Okay, so... And that is up for review, and Judge Hoke is considering whether or not it's appropriate for him to be over those, which I'm certain it won't be. The same exact reason he gave, saying, no, we're just pros, they're just professional friends. It's the exact same terminology used by Judge Ferguson and the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals Chief Justice Tim Armstead said Judge Ferguson could not preside over those matters. And the judge also, I did present that argument to the judge too, in which he was in agreement. So he will be making his decision soon in that matter, sir. Okay. So essentially, Mr. Sir, he's been recused from all matters and all your cases yeah. then? Right now, it's, it's official only on the habeas, but I believe that it, uh, he is going to be recused from the grand proceedings also due to the conflict of interest. Okay. But then all, you also said that you were appointed. I mean, I, that hasn't happened yet. I mean, I guess you're awaiting Judge Hoke's order to appoint no, you. I, I have been appointed a counsel. He appointed, uh, Judge Hoke did appoint criminal defense counsel and also uh, habeas corpus counsel. And they are from the West Virginia Public Defender Services under the direction of uh, Ada Dan Petty, the executive director of the West Virginia Public Defender Services. Okay. Yeah, but has they named a person yet, or is it just, you know, you... Uh, that, that'll be up to uh, Mr. Eddie. Eddie, okay. Signs. I'm not familiar with who that will be. He also signed a proposed order for me, which I presented a proposed order for attorney-client communication and incoming telephone calls and conferences. So due to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, attorneys don't come to the jails to visit anybody. They also, you can't call them. They're not going to give you their personal numbers, and that's understandable because disgruntled inmates would relentlessly harass them. I'm in full agreement with them not giving their numbers out. However, this facility put in certain protocols that attorneys can only call in if they have a court order. So I gave the proposed court order to the Honorable Judge Oak at the beginning of the hearing and explained that situation to him. And he did, in fact, issue that order so that I may have incoming calls and phone conference with, my, with the attorneys that he appointed to me. Okay. All right. So I got a lot accomplished. I'm very happy with Judge Oak's a very, very square across the board. Similar 
honor to you and your writing. I mean, it's just amazing that people are actually, you know, being balanced for once. Okay, so at at this hearing, was it were there was there any spect was there anybody in attendance, or was it just you know the participants no. in the court staff? No, just me, Sorce, and the judge. And you said it lasted a good three hours. Yes, sir. Okay. It's been a three hours. All right, and you obviously it sounds you know from the tone of your voice it sounds like this is something you've been you're very excited about. Talk about yes, sir. I'm very excited about it, but I've, I've been very prepared. It took me seven years to get this hearing, and uh, it was a windfall. It was it, it was exactly what justice. Uh, George Prudence was served. Um, uh, Judge Oak was fair across the board, and I mean, it, it, obviously he's he, he's he's seeing things for what they are. The evidence supports the claims. They're not false. They're not frivolous. They're not malicious or vexatious. This is actual factual evidence. The medical evidence speaks for itself, as does the, me the, the trial record and the grand jury record. Uh, we did, I did ours also, uh, it was real simple. Uh, states knowing use of perjured testimony is considered prosecutorial misconduct, in which everybody had to agree, including Mr. Sorce. However, it goes further than that. When a prosecutor knowingly uses perjured testimony, he must support that perjured testimony. And when he does that, he commits criminalized prosecutorial misconduct. And it just absolutely stunned. His argument was completely done. There was nothing else to discuss. You cannot justify that. It's illegal. No man is above the law. And uh, federal judge Cheryl Eifert is the one that told me, Mr. Trying to study Himmler versus Patchman. There is criminal liabilities for a prosecutor to knowingly use perjured testimony. And that's exactly what this case entails, sir. Okay, and and I and something that you brought up before is that, you know, of course you have long taken your innocence that you did not murder Mr. Clay, and I but most certainly did not. Well, but one of the things that was brought up in the trial or that was alleged that he was beaten brutally with a baseball bat, but yet you have obtained the medical examiner's report, and it says it doesn't. And correct me if I'm wrong. But was that ever introduced at trial, the medical examiner's report? No, it wasn't. And my lawyer wouldn't use it. That was another argument that Mr. Sorsetti tried to say, well, he had an attorney that could have brought all this up during trial. And that didn't, that, 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 that didn't happen. Um, my lawyer, John Flash Lashley, sat with the prosecution board of my entire trial and never objected once. He told me to either accept the 10 flat or he would allow the state to prove their case, even though I maintain my innocence throughout. And the medical records clearly established these injuries never occurred. We did address this with Judge Farrell prior to the trial numerous times that these injuries never existed. I made, the, I made Judge Farrell order DNA testing and fingerprints to be done on that baseball bat where my DNA did not come back, nor did my fingerprints. They fought me every step of the way. But Judge Farrell knew that that testimony was false by James Markham and everybody else when it was being presented by Christopher Childs, and he took no actions. He sat quietly, and that was another thing that stunned. Judge Hope was just absolutely appalled by that, too. We covered every angle yesterday, sir, in three hours of just constant bantering, and it was absolutely amazing. But the story itself is also absolutely amazing. One minute remaining. Okay, well, if you want to go ahead and conclude this, we'll maybe try to wrap it up here on this uh, follow-up call. Okay, um, all right. If it's possible, you want me to make another call? Yeah, and then we'll wrap it. I don't. I know you've probably got other things to do, and, you know, like I said, we'll Very wrap, good. kind of give a, don't want to go too long, but, yeah, we'll wrap this segment up, and we'll conclude Very on the next Very one. Good. If you can, uh, keep uh, my wife informed, and I'll, I'll, I'm sure she's looking forward to the story also. If you need to speak with me again, please contact her. Thank okay. you, sir. Okay, okay.